Hello, and welcome to Other Voices, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. I'm your host, Paul George. Of all the responsibilities that fall on the shoulders of a president, it has long been clear that foreign policy is beyond Trump's abilities. Woefully ignorant before taking office, he has done nothing to learn, and it shows. There are numerous tinderbox situations in the Middle East, all made more dangerous by Trump's impulsive, ill-informed actions. On this edition of Other Voices, we'll take a deep, authoritative look at the region's many hot spots, what Trump is up to in those areas, and what his possible, we hope probable, successors might do differently. To help, us, help guide us through this long list of hot spots, I'm very pleased to welcome Stephen Zunas, Professor of Politics and International Studies at University of San Francisco. Stephen, welcome to Other Voices. Great to be with you. Really glad to have you here. Um, Stephen was the founding director of the program in Middle Eastern Studies at University of San Francisco and is recognized as one of the country's leading scholars uh, of U.S. Middle East policy and of strategic nonviolent action. Professor Zunas serves as a senior policy analyst for the Foreign Policy and Focus Project of the Institute for Policy Studies, is an associate editor of Peace Review, and a contributing editor of Tikkun Magazine. He's made frequent visits to the Middle East and other conflict regions. Just got back from Sudan, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll get a chance to talk about that before the hour is up. Uh, lots of travel where he's met with top government officials, academics, journalists, and opposition leaders. So uh, last week, I couldn't have started out this way because we had six candidates, and it would have taken forever to go through six presidential candidates and their positions on some of these spots in the Middle East. But we suddenly find ourselves down to two, so let me start there. <laughs> Why don't we start with comparing and contrasting the people who are trying to take over uh, the White House, um, what their positions might be, and then we'll take a look at what the U.S. policy is now. So let, let's start with the Israel-Palestine conflict. Mm -hmm. Trump just rolled out his big peace plan. We'll mm -hmm. talk about that in a minute. What are the visions that Bernie Sanders and uh, Joe Biden have toward this region? Is it substantially different than the traje trajectory of U.S. policy over many years? Um, Oh, Try to introduce us to this. <laughs> oh, both uh, uh, Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden are committed to Israel's right to exist in peace and security. Um, uh, uh, Bernie is Jewish, and he actually lived in Israel for a short time in his youth, working on a kibbutz. Uh, but they, 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 they couldn't be more different in their approach. Uh, they, um, uh, uh, Bernie uh, believes that, uh, that uh, you know, <clears throat> Israel should withdraw from the occupied territories, uh, stop the uh, illegal colonization uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, occupied territories, um, and has generally done, done a, a, a major job in um, doing um, um, work in trying to bring Israelis and Palestinians together. He's been quite, um, quite uh, active in in uh, trying to shift U.S. policy away from the traditional, you know, let Israel do pretty much whatever he wants. He's talked, about, he's spoken out against Israeli war crimes, for example. Uh -huh. um, the um, uh, we've also had <clears throat> uh, Biden couldn't be diff more different. Biden is de definitely more on the hawkish wing of the party. He's very much someone who has uh, defended uh, Israeli uh, violations of international legal norms. He has. Um, Engaged in, uh, um, he's, he co-sponsored as far back as 1994. He co-sponsored a resolution calling on the United States to move its embassy uh, from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and recognize Jerusalem as the uh, 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 sole capital. In uh, 94, uh, uh, back way back in 94, he pushed it uh, every few years. It was a big, big thing of his. Uh, but it, the, the bill, uh, the mandating the move, let, let it let, let, left it to the, the the president to uh, you know waive it or not. And uh, it was too extreme even for George W. Bush, but Trump finally enacted a Biden's yeah. resolution uh, by doing that. Uh, Biden's also attacked the International Court of Justice uh, when it said Israel could build a separation wall along its internationally recognized border, but it couldn't build it in this serpentine fashion deep inside the West Bank as a way of, uh, of, of incorporating these illegal settlements. 
well, um, <clears throat> Biden attacked the World Court, you know, saying that it, it's, a, it's an attack against Israel's right to self-defense. They have no business uh, uh, dealing with questions of international humanitarian law in the occupied territories, which, of course, is one of the functions of the World Court. He's even attacked the United Nations from getting involved, saying the UN should not be involved. It should be just between um, the Israeli occupiers and the Palestinians uh, uh, under occupation decide among themselves what should happen, ignoring, of course, the gross asymmetry in power between the two. When he was vice president, he, he, he undermined um, uh, President Obama's, you know, a, a timid uh, push to, for, to get the Israelis to, to compromise. He was basically seen as the Israelis' best friend uh, in, in the White House. Un undermined how? Oh, 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 basically to, um, you know, to, to make, make it clear that, uh, you know, not to take Obama's pressure too seriously. That it would not really, <laughs> we, they really wouldn't, wouldn't do anything about it. That he, uh, he was uh, would just talking. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, uh, and, and, and basically did not, he, he's, he's very much been part, I mean, if you were to look at sort of in, in, um, in Israeli political uh, language, um, um, uh, Sanders is closer to Meretz, which is a left Zionist party, whereas uh, Biden's closer to Likud. Or if you look in terms of, of uh, American politics, uh, um, Bernie's closer to J Street, uh, where, <laughs> whereas uh, Biden is very much in the APAC, the APAC wing, sort of wing, wing of things. Explain quickly what J Street yeah, is. Uh, J, 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 yeah, J Street is a, a liberal Zionist group that uh, supports a secure Israel, but uh, realizes that in order for there to be a secure Israel and for there to be peace, uh, uh, Israel needs to withdraw from the occupied territories and stop the expansion of settlements. So. Um, one of the things I, I did to prepare for this, because it's hard to find any real information on, on these candidate websites, mm -hmm. I, I read the rather lengthy uh, New York Times editorial board interviews with both of these candidates. One thing that's where they seem to be very diametrically opposed is they both said they would continue U.S. aid to Israel, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. $4 billion a year mm -hmm. still around. Mm -hmm. But Bernie made a... Bernie Sanders made a very, um, went out of his way to make a point that we should be using that aid to leverage things that we want yes. out of Israel. Biden just skipped that question entirely. I, mean, I just skipped it, but, but in, uh, in various uh, other uh, interviews, he had denounced uh, Sanders and Warren, who had made the same position, even Buttigieg, who, who mentioned that possibility as being totally irresponsible, that under no circumstances should we condition our aid to, to Israel. This is despite what Amnesty International and the majority of the American public <laughs> have long been been saying that uh, aid to Israel, like any aid to any country, should be contingent on um, on human rights norms and a willingness to make peace. Yeah, as far as I remember, it was only George H. W. Bush who actually went so far as to threaten to hold up loan guarantees. Right. Over settlement building. That was a long time ago. Yeah, he, I don't think anybody else has actually conditioned aid um, on yeah, some kind of behavior. Yeah, yeah. Unless you want to go back to Eisenhower. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I am right. It was George H.W. Yes, Bush's yes. only kind right. of and he was, and, and, and he line. was, And he had to uh, modify that when he was getting a lot of pressure from the uh, Democratic nominee, Bill Clinton, who uh, once he came to uh, uh, office ended up converting... Uh, many of the, 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 the Congress had, had um, uh, agreed to reduce the amount of the loan guarantee from the $2 billion um, uh, dollar annual installment uh, for the, the cost of building new settlements and infrastructure. And basically what Clinton did was, don't worry about it, we'll make it up to you. And sure enough, he raised U.S. aid to Israel by the half billion or so dollars. That was that was, so basically he convert. he knew the, the message was to the, to the Israelis was the more settlements you build, we will convert a loan guarantee into a grant. All right. Anything else we should know about their positions that stands out to you? I mean, U.S. policy in regards yeah, well, to... Well, I think this is, this is an area... Well, there's been a huge shift in the Democratic Party on this issue. I mean, a huge shift. That uh, It used to be one that uh, you know, every, every, US, every uh, candidate for president had to go to AIPAC for, on an election year to speak. Um, and not only did Warren and Sanders refuse to go, uh, but... Um, uh, Buttigieg and Klobuchar, uh, and Klobuchar is a big surprise because she's pretty hawkish as well, uh, de declined. And uh, it, that, that is a huge shift. And I think it reflects the uh, public opinion. I mean, there is a, um, it used to be you could go as far as to the right as you, you, you wanted to, and it would not hurt you politically. But 
um, people in the broader liberal peace wing of the party who used to just kind of avoid talking about Israel and says, well, yeah, well, they kind of have to do that. Let's, 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 let's endorse them, let's support them unconditionally anyway. No, it's getting more like Central America in the 80s and, 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 and other issues where people are saying, hey, wait a minute. No, this is, this, is, this is wrong. This is not necessarily an anti-Zionist thing or an anti-Israel thing. We shouldn't be supporting governments that are, are doing the kind of things that Netanyahu is doing. And the fact we have a serious contender like uh, Sanders overtly calling the Prime Minister of Israel a racist. I mean, that's, that's huge. That, that, and, 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 and in fact, the, the times he was interrupted by applause when, when he and, yes. and, and Warren, had, you know, Warren, Warren and other critics talked about this. Um, so we were, but unfortunately, uh, Biden is, is way back in that kind of starry-eyed idealism of Israel from Paul Newman in Exodus in the early 60s, you know, that is, he, <laughs> he really has not recognized as the, that things are changing both in Israel and here in the United States. Here in the United States, I, I, yeah. I, I think that's true. Uh, I've been doing this long enough that, as I'm sure you know, you get beat up a lot if you <laughs> <No>. <laughs> dare, to, dare to criticize certain countries around here. Um, Let's, let's go from our candidates to Israel just had their third election in a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's talk about the results about that and, and where that takes this entire issue mm -hmm. uh, into the future. Well, uh, and, and I say this, we know that the results aren't yeah. complete yet. It takes them longer to count ballots right. than <laughs> California. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> well, the, the, Unfortunately, just as uh, Americans and American Jews in particular are moving more and more to the left on on the question of, of, of Israel and Palestine, uh, Israel's going the opposite going direction. Right. Uh, it's going more and more to the right. I mean, the the, the so-called moderate alternative to uh, um, Netanyahu was a general who was in charge of the 2014 Israeli offensive in Gaza, you know, which uh, Amnesty International, uh, Human Rights Watch, and very, even uh, various Israeli human rights groups denounced for serious war crimes. And um, he, the, you know, he, he was uh, at best center-right. <laughs> so it was the center-right and far-right basically yeah. was the choice. And it looks like the far-right will probably be able to uh, assemble another, uh, another coalition. And um, so it, it, it's, it's looking... Let's, let's catch the audience up just in case somebody doesn't understand. In Israel, you need to have a uh, majority plus one seats yes. in, in the and parliament. They, and, they have proportional, the and they have proportional representation, which I think is a good thing, actually. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it really does uh, represent, uh, it gives people a chance not just to vote for the lesser evil, but to you know vote for a party that they, they believe in. Yeah. And, but the, the pro problem is, though, is sometimes it's very hard to hobble together the, that, that, that kind of... Um, um, a kind of uh, majority. Go ahead you and shut it off. I, I, don't, I, I thought it was off already. We, we I'm sorry. To... I'm really sorry. Yeah, I, thought it, okay. I thought it was off. I don't know why, why this, uh, what this happened. But um, the... Um... This is organic television, Right, folks. right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <clears throat> the... the uh, and, and so uh, you know, uh, Netanyahu is, is going to probably be able to put together another, another coalition, including some far-right parties. This, it, it mainly said, I mean, it shows the hypocrisy of U.S. foreign policy in every government, including Obama's. U.S. position was if the Palestine uh, Authority had even one cabinet member uh, who was a member of Hamas or any other group that didn't recognize Israel's right to exist, didn't uh, commit to the agreements that have been made at Oslo and, 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 and uh, since then didn't renounce viol uh, uh, didn't renounce violence. They cut off all aid, contact, anything with the Palestine Authority. However, in, in, in uh, Netanyahu's coalition government he and, and, and his likely future coalition government, there are extremist Israeli parties which have openly called for tearing up the Oslo Accords, for ethnically cleansing uh, Palestinians who have ties to these right-wing settler militia which have committed acts of terrorism. And so it's, uh, it's one of the many areas of the double standards the United States has in dealing with Israelis and Palestinians. So he's going to be making deals with these small parties. These extreme right, right parties, extreme even further right, right than him. In order to get over yeah. the, the hump to... He did just as he did last time. I and mean, these parties are already in government. And it looks like they'll be in government again. But that doesn't bother Trump, of course, you know, who's, who's uh, top Middle East uh, uh, people, including his ambassador to Israel, actually has some ties to these right-wing settler groups. <laughs> so... Uh, what kind of ties? Does well, he uh, yeah, well, he's, yeah, he's, he's funded uh, funded some of these um, extremist uh, 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 settler groups. Uh, he's uh, basically uh, 
he doesn't even believe in even a pretend two-state solution. Uh, he's uh, said that uh, uh, people like in J Street, you know, who, who, who support Israel but want to end the occupation are worse than capos, which is the term used for Jewish collaborators with the Nazis. Um, and this is, our, this is our ambassador to that's Israel. That's our ambassador to <laughs> yeah, Israel. Yeah. Uh, one thing, I, the impression I got, and I'm I, not up to speed on Israeli elections, but I understand that the, uh, what they call the joint list of the Arab parties. There's, there's a certain Arab population within Israel, and they, they vote, and they run candidates, mm -hmm. and they, they won more seats this year than they ever have because mm -hmm. they came together, I think, 15 seats. Mm -hmm. Is that significant? Well, see, um, yes, it is. In fact, they are, for the first time, they're attracting a fair amount of, of left-wing Jewish support. The Israeli left had traditionally supported Meretz and some of the more left Zionist parties. But an increasing number of Israelis no longer even see themselves as Zionists, but post-Zionist, in the sense they believe that, uh, you know, maybe a two-state solution, maybe an Israeli-Jewish state alongside a Palestinian state could have worked. But at this point, the uh, settlements uh, have changed the demographics uh, so much that a contiguous viable uh, West Bank state is no longer possible and that they need to start looking seriously at a binational state or some kind of uh, state where there can be you know, guaranteed individual and collective rights of both uh, 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 Arabs and Jews. So we're seeing a greater polarization in Israeli society just as we're having in the United States and a lot of other countries in the world. Yeah. How has uh, the Trump, Jared Kushner peace plan been received in Israel, in Palestine, and in the region? Well, both uh, Netanyahu and his rival Barry Gans uh, uh, endorsed it enthusiastically. Uh, it was not, uh, again, an, an illustration of how little difference it is in the two major blocks in Israeli politics. Although um, Gantz said he would want to work with the international community before annexing part of right, right, the right. West Bank. <laughs> that seemed to be the only difference yeah. between the two yeah. of them. And I don't even know what that means because the international community as opposed to that, because oh, it yeah, violates yeah, yeah, very, yeah, very, law. very much so. Though maybe he considers uh, uh, the Trump administration part of the international <laughs> community, which uh, which has endo endorsed uh, the uh, the annexation of Golan. This is the first time, um, with the exception of Australia temporarily um, uh, recognizing Indonesia's annexation of East Timor. I don't think any major country has recognized a uh, a nation expanding its territory by military force uh, since the signing of the UN Charter. Uh, until um, Trump's which, recognition which of, of, that of, kind of, of behavior, yeah, yeah, his, his annexation of Golan, um, and the likely support of Israeli annexation of large swaths of the uh, West Bank. Uh, so, I mean, so the concerns here are not just those of us who are concerned about Isra Israel and Palestine, but those of us who are concerned about um, um, uh, international law in, in in general, because the the precedent here is very, very bad. Yeah, our, our own laws are having trouble standing up these yeah. days, let mm -hmm. alone international law, which already stands on a pretty mm -hmm. yeah. shaky platform. Um, is is the uh, Trump peace plan, I've got to use the scare, scare quotes each time, is it going anywhere or are we just... No, it's not, it's not going anywhere. I mean, basically, it's... it's it, it won't form uh, the yeah, basis yeah, yeah, for... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like a, a South African Bantu stand, those notorious tribal homelands that were segmented and surrounded by white South Africa, a similar kind of thing that they, um, it's, it, it's, it doesn't come close to the amount of total land that the Palestinians, um, you know, uh, were hoping for in the West Bank and Gaza Strip in the 20% of historic Palestine. That's all they're asking for now, but, but uh, the U.S. consensus under both Republican and Democratic administrations that that was too much. They had to settle for, for, for even less. But Trump's plan is not only a big reduction in the total amount of land, but again, it's, it's subdividing these tiny uh, uh, non-contiguous uh, cantons. And, uh, and, and with, with, uh, even within those, there are these, these large Jewish enclaves, like yeah. in, in, like in the, including, including downtown uh, Hebron, one of the largest cities in the West yeah. Bank. And, uh, and not a single settlement would be removed in this plan. And so, and if you, and anybody's been to the West Bank, you know, they're just all over the place. I mean, it's just, it, 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 how they can divide that up is just really hard it, to, it, hard, it, it, hard, hard, hard to imagine. Yeah. Israel will control the, um, uh, the, the internet, it would, they control the, um, the, the uh, airspace, control the aquifers, control the, the coming, yeah, yeah, yeah. Contr control the uh, comings and goings. 
uh, not just, you know, obviously they can control coming going to their own country, but between the Palestinian state and any neighboring, neighboring Arab state, or even between segments of the Palestinian state. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, it's not, not, not nothing close to anything resembling a viable nation state. No Palestinian leader could uh, um, um, uh, accept that. So for activists here in this country, what should we be looking for these days? Is there any initiative that people should be backing or? Well, I mean, I, I think... Uh, <clears throat> is the boycott movement... Well, first, we, like, well, first we, we got to make sure, if you're concerned with israeli Palestinian peace, you need to make sure that Trump is not re-elected. Yeah. And that Biden isn't elected either, <laughs> frankly. Because remember, Biden supported the Sharon plan, the convergence plan back in 2004, which is very, very similar to the Trump plan. <laughs> uh, really, and really not a whole lot of difference. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, he's he's not uh, you can't you can't expect to, for him to, to move things uh, for for it as well, um, and I, I think we also need to um, I, I mean to to, um, to to address it not on on ideological uh, grounds. I mean I don't, I don't I don't want to get into arguments about Zionism and defining Zionism, anti-Zionism, whatever. But let's talk about just basic principles like human rights, international law, and, and self-determination, and uh, how uh, U.S. policy has not only not brought any justice for Palestinians, it's not brought security for Israel either, yeah. and that uh, it, it, Palestinian rights and Israeli security are, are are not mutually exclusive, but ultimately mutually dependent upon the other. And the United States has been supporting some of the most reactionary elements within Israel, which in turn uh, creates a, a, a backlash from some of the more reactionary elements in Palestinian society, like Hamas. Uh -huh. So, no, no apparent way out, even. So. Yeah, but but I mean I mean but you know look, East Timor used to be a hopeless cause. That's true. Ending apartheid seemed like a hopeless cause. I yeah. mean, the other people in the studio audience here, who I'm sure were involved in. In the struggles and more, and and uh, we, we we saw how uh, uh, we initially had very little support uh, among uh, uh, in in Congress, even among Democrats. But we kept on struggling, kept on working, and pretty sure it uh, it became it, uh, it it shifted. And again, we're already seeing a big shift, as I as I mentioned, not necessarily in in, 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 in some of the top leaders, but certainly on the grassroots on Israel and Palestine. Yeah, as always, it's a long hard road. Yeah. Uh, and you just got to keep walking down that road. Let's let's shift our attention over to um, Iran for uh, a little bit. Um, in the w the wake of the assassination of Soleimani and mm -hmm. and almost coming to uh, to direct confrontation, the U.S. has cranked up sanctions uh, yet again on Iran. More oil sanctions, metals. Um, consumer goods, manufacturing. Mm. They've sanctioned a whole bunch of um, individuals in, in the uh, Iranian government, both in the military mm. and w within their civilian government. Um, Even the foreign minister is one of the leading moderates that I, <laughs> whom I got to meet with in that for a full hour in, in Tehran about a year ago. He's, um, even he's on the list, even though he has absolutely nothing to do with the um, um, uh, hardline elements that are you know, some of the bad things you're doing. I suspect the Trump administration is running out of people and items to sanction. Yep, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and so they just keep yep. going down the mm -hmm. list. So and how is maximum pressure working? This and it, it's terrible. I mean, that it has really put the economy in tailspin. And uh, But, I mean, part of it is, I mean, frankly, the Iranian government has been grossly mismanaging the, the economy. There's a lot of corruption. It would not be in great shape anyway, but... Um, it's gotten even worse as a result of these um, these draconian sanctions, which are hurting ordinary people more. And and uh, as uh, as Foreign Minister Zarif explained a year ago, and we're seeing this even more so, that he put a lot of stake into negotiating this treaty. The hardliners were saying, "No, you can't trust the United States. If you do what the United States has, we're going to have to destroy billions of dollars of military uh, equipment and fuel and, and centrifuges and and uh, and." pour concrete into a brand new reactor. I mean, there's billions of dollars of, and years of research and, um, and, 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 and be unique and not and having st real strict, strict limitations, far more than almost any other country on our nuclear f uh, program, even if, even if it's just for nuclear power, nuclear medicine, and, and whatever. These, but, uh, and what's going to stop the United States from after we've done all this to just reimposing the sanctions? And Zarif um, 
And uh, President Rouhani said, no, you can trust the United States. It's an, it's an international agreement. Everything's going to be, be fine. And, and, sure, and because and, and, it wasn't just the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is a seven-party seven party, uh, agreement. Yeah. But because but with the United States pulling out, basically uh, that what Trump has been doing is it punishes companies in other countries, and, and, and if they're state-owned, the countries themselves, if they have any business with Iran. So almost any, any company, let's say Total, the major uh, uh, um, French petroleum company, you know, if they if they went through and honored their contracts with Iran, they were completely cut off in the U.S. market. Of course, yeah. U.S. market is bigger. So in a sense, they're, it's reimposed the entire international sanctions regime on Iran, um, right. even though all all the other parties of the agreement didn't like what the uh, United States did. And so the hardliners are on are in the ascendancy, uh, and their purges are the liners moderates in Iran. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. We know they're in. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, because because. Um, and you know, people like Zarif and Rouhani are now are now marginalized um, because because of this. So this so that's particularly upsetting. I think people who are in the, the pro democracy movement in Iran who've been struggling against this uh, reactionary regime all these years is that has really set back their effort uh, because when they're under that kind of pressure, people tend to rally around the flag. Yeah, as we saw after the assassination of Soleimani, yeah, these exactly. massive yeah. massive yeah. demonstrations. I got to think uh, with. Um, Coronavirus hitting Iran really hard. It's mm -hmm. one of the hardest hit countries in the world. What what effect do we know? What effect the U.S. sanctions oh, are having it, on it, their it, ability it's, to it's, raise It's one money. of the reasons. It's one one of the epicenters, and in, in large part because they can't get a lot of the, uh, the medicines and hospital equipment, and that that kind of thing. Not that medical uh, supplies are 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 are, par, are part of this ban, right. but just, but but just in terms of having the having the cash and being able to transfer funds and just the, the whole transactional side of it, is, it makes it all the more, all the more difficult to get even, even legal supplies in. What about the uh, possibility, it does seem to have reduced recently, but uh, continued threat of direct military confrontation between the U.S. and Iran? It's still, it's still very high. I mean, I, I, I don't think Trump is, um, uh, necessarily wants war with Iran. I think he naively thinks that brinkmanship will get them to, to buckle. I mean, he, he made his, um, um, I mean, that's how he got around New York, is basically bullying people and threatening people and, yeah. and going up to the brink and, uh, and, and eventually people would fold or the New York City government would fold or whatever and he'd, he'd, uh, he'd come out as a winner. So that, that's sort of his style of play, but that doesn't work in international diplomacy. And I think the big mistake the United States has made with Iran, not just with Trump, but uh, overall, is that um, we see it in terms of, of its Islamist characteristics and not the strong sense of nationalism they have. I mean, if you use the analogy of Vietnam, a big mistake in Vietnam is we saw this as communist expansionism. How do you stop a spreading totalitarian movement? You do it with military force. Yet, even though the North Vietnam was a communist country and the National Liberation Front, what we call the Viet Cong, was communist-led, um, it was first and foremost a nationalist movement. Right. So we couldn't understand why the more we bombed, the more troops we sent, the, the higher the resistance. Yeah. And this is the exact same thing happening with, with, with Iran because the, the, the Iranians are some of those nationalistic people in the world. And if any of you, and, you, know, if any of you all know people from a Persian background, you know they're, how proud people are of their, of their, of their heritage. And, and rightfully and, so. Yeah, 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 very much so. Um, and so... Um, you know, when when, uh, when 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 Trump is trying to push Iran around like it's a banana republic, uh, ignoring the fact that they've uh, been a, a major regional power on and off for the past 2,500 years, you know, it's, it's simply it's simply not going to work. It's creating this reaction again. It's paradoxically strengthening the regime instead of weakening it. Yeah. Um, let's go back to our candidates now. Mm -hmm. Wh where do they stand, Joe Biden on, well, on Iran? Well, both of them um, uh, want to go back to the agreement. Um, I don't know if that's possible. I mean, again, the hardliners are now that on the ascendancy, and, yeah. and it could be it could be difficult. And and if that doesn't work, I you know I I I, I think that's where the differences might come in. Uh, the um, you know Biden supported a plank in the 2016 diplomatic uh, uh, or democratic platform that called for military action against Iran if they reneged on the agreement. Um, this is despite the fact that the agreement uh, uh, did not. Uh, it has uh, mechanisms. It may, may have, have mechanisms, and, and in, in no way will allow any one, any one of the six, six co-signatories to launch a unilateral strike. That would be uh, 
uh, you know, direct violation of the UN Charter and everything else. So that uh, was a plank in the Democratic yeah, platform. Yeah, in 2016, that Biden, and Biden, Biden, was Biden, Biden supported. It. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and Bernie is, is very much opposed to that kind of thing. I mean, I think he's certainly concerned with the problem of, um, of uh, nu nuclear proliferation. But I think he takes a more holistic view. I think uh, Bernie is a kind of person who would you know, push for a nuclear uh, a free zone for the entire Middle East, similar to what, uh, and South Asia. Um, uh, I mean, similar to where they're already, they're already uh, um, nuclear weapons free zones in Latin America, in Africa, in Central Asia, in Southeast Asia, in Antarctic, in South Pacific. And, uh, you know, Sanders would uh, support something like a uh, similar nuclear weapons free zone in South and Southwest Asia as well. But the United States has uh, traditionally rejected that because, you know, we, our allies, uh, Israel, Pakistan, and India have nuclear weapons, and we like to bring nuclear weapons in on our ships. And so we, 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 so we, we are practicing kind of nuclear apartheid, basically. We and our allies can have nuclear weapons, but Iran can't even have a nuclear program that might even have the potential someday of, 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 of becoming uh, weaponized. And, um, and generally, arms control agreements don't work unless there's reciprocity, unless there's mutuality in it. Right. And again, this is really, uh, you know, the, given that strong sense of nationalism, it's like, why are we being singled out this way? Uh, this, is, this is completely unfair. I mean, there, there are, are um, um, given that uh, Iraq attacked them with chemical weapons and the world didn't respond, um, and, uh, you know, they, 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 you know the, and the United States has threatened to attack them, Israel has threatened to attack them. Israel has nuclear submarines off their coast in the Persian Gulf, yeah. as we do, as, as, we, as we do as well. And, and uh, so one can, might understand why they might want a deterrent. Um, but again, the U.S. is saying, no, we, we can't, uh, that, that you can't have this kind of thing. And, and it's not just where we're enforcing U.N. resolutions, because U.N. Security Council Resolutions 487 calls on Israel to place its nuclear facilities under the trusteeship of the International Atomic Energy Agency. They've been, they've been violating uh, that, uh, that resolution for close to 30 years now, and we have still... They um, won't even admit they uh, have yeah, yeah. nuclear and, weapons. And, 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 and uh, Pakistan and, uh, and, and um, India have been violating Security Council Resolution 1172 since the late 90s, or well over 20 years. And so, um, as again, an example of the double standards our, our foreign policy has had on, on nonproliferation issues. And I, I believe it was at the end of the 1991 uh, Gulf War in Iraq that uh, the U.S. called for a nuclear free zone in, uh, in the Middle East. Actually, actually, we didn't. We, 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 the, 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 the resolution that ended the Gulf War did call for, um, um, 687, I think, uh, called uh, you know, for Iraqi disarmament in the context of region-wide disarmament. But we, uh, never, we never enforced that part. No, no <laughs> not region-wide, just certain people, as right. you say. All right. Um, anything else on Iran? Uh, in terms of our, our candidates that we should be paying attention to? Um, that kind of covers the, the, the basics of it, yeah. Okay, we are, we are going to turn to our studio audience for some questions and answers. Um, Julia will be coming around with the microphone, and because of the virus going around, she's just going to hold the mic. Don't grab it and pass it around, okay? But we're going to take a little uh, quick break first. We've produced a, a public service announcement. This is kind of like what I'm going to ask you to participate in afterwards. Uh, so we're going to take a one-minute break. You'll see most of it up here on the screen, and then we'll be right back with Stephen Zunas, professor of uh, politics and international studies at University of San Francisco. Let's roll the tape, as they say. And I will just mention, we hope you will all join us on April 24th for the Global Climate Strike March and Rally here in Palo Alto and next month's Other Voices program, 
will be on all the various events going on. Uh, April 22nd, of course, is Earth Day. There's going to be climate strike actions on that Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We'll have the organizers of a lot of these actions here on, on the show uh, next month. That will be April 7th. And we, were, we had uh, Peninsula Peace and Justice Center had over 1,000 people out last September where some of this footage was shot. We're, we hope to double that. Um, barring any coronaviruses and things like that. <laughs> so if you have a question, please hold up your hand and wait for Julia to uh, arrive with the microphone. I'm not seeing any hands. Oh, here we go. All right, we've got some hands. And then if you would stand up, and Julia will hold the microphone for you. Uh, face this way. She'll, uh, she'll excuse, take care. Excuse my ignorance, but what is APAC? Yeah. Uh, APAC is the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Uh, which is a lobbying organization. It's not a PAC as in political action committee. They don't give money directly to candidates, so they have allied PACs that do that. And it's traditionally called itself the pro-Israel lobby in the United States. So J Street would say, we're also a pro-Israel lobby, we're just not a right-wing pro-Netanyahu lobby. Um, you know, a lot of people see them as very, very powerful, uh, which, uh, well, relatively speaking, they are, but I personally, I think it's sometimes exaggerated in the sense that... Um, it's not the, it explains our bias towards uh, Israel. I mean, for example, we support Indonesia's occupation of East Timor, we support South Africa, apartheid South Africa's occupation in Libya. To this day, we support Morocco's occupation of Western Sahara. It's not like we, um, we need an a, a ethnic lobby to force us to, to uh, support <laughs> allies engaging in invasions, occupations, colonization, suppression of weaker neighbors, and similarly, you know, the rationalizations for Israeli war crimes in um, Lebanon and Gaza and elsewhere is, isn't that much different than our rationalization for Saudi war crimes in, in Yemen or, my God, what we've done in uh, places like Iraq and, and elsewhere. Uh, so um, I, I just, uh, it, it's, um, I think, you know, basically the, the uh, I, I challenge, challenge a sense that uh, tries to try to blame uh, APAC for everything because unfortunately it's, it's much, um, it's uh, deeper than that. It's the problems we have in, in about U.S. foreign policy elsewhere as well. The Middle East is not a big exception. I guess the one area APAC does have some cloud is that there's some, some otherwise you know, liberal members of Congress that will take some pretty hardline uh, positions where they might have uh, taken more moderate positions otherwise. But, but uh, you know, Congress usually doesn't make foreign policy, and most of these. Uh, so-called pro-Israel uh, resolutions uh, they're passed are, are non-binding. Uh, so uh, I, I would say that uh, we, um, um, it, it's, 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 it complicates, it, it makes dissent more difficult, it makes, di it makes dissenting voices more difficult to hear and, and, and uh, critical, vo critical dialogue more difficult. But the overall thrust of U.S. foreign policy, I believe, would be more or less the same, even if uh, APAC didn't exist. Okay, and uh, another question in the back here. Well, um, since you've just come back from Sudan, <laughs> which is a area of the world that I felt kind of hopeless about for so many decades, and it seems like maybe there's some exciting stuff going on in Africa at this point. I wondered if you could comment oh, yeah. on well, what's well, going on. Yeah, that, uh, I, it's fine to segue. It's, yeah, it's and, not the Middle East. But yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, actually, Sudan is in the Middle East, well, uh, in a sense. Yeah, they remember the Arab League, and oh, you know, they're right. very that's much right. yeah, yeah. Arabic as a national language. Okay. Uh, they're, they're, they're a large number of non-Arabic speakers. It's a, it's a multi-ethnic society, but uh, uh, majority majority Arab. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a very exciting there. I mean, um, in that uh, for 30 years they lived under the, one of the most brutal dictatorships in the world. I mean, literally genocidal. Uh, Al-Bashir has been indicted by the International Criminal Court for uh, um, crimes against humanity in Darfur. Uh, civil society had been decimated. Uh, the country, there are some small-scale civil wars, not just in Darfur, but in the Nuba Mountains and other parts of the country. Uh, literacy was high. Um, it was, it, it was uh, the, the, the uh, military government had made an alliance with this far right wing Islamist party, so women were suppressed, couldn't leave the home without male relatives, had to cover up, all that kind of thing. And yet, uh, remarkably, starting a little over, uh, starting in December of 2018, a massive nonviolent movement emerged. 
And it was, it was one of those disciplined nonviolent movements, not even rock throwing or anything like that. It was quite, quite remarkable, practically Gandhian in their nonviolent discipline. And again, this is a place that has wars all over the place. In fact, the opposition had an armed struggle, you know, from the, uh, that lasted from the, uh, uh, you know, for almost a decade, starting in the 90s. Uh, but this time, they decided to go completely nonviolent. And um, by April, with millions of people in the street, it forced al-Bashir uh, from, from, from power. Uh, the military overthrew him of them. And then, unlike the Egyptians, they didn't say, thank the military and go home. They said, we want you guys out of there as well. And they kept on struggling. And this is despite hundreds of people being gunned down. I mean, uh, they, they kept on going, kept on going, and then negotiated a power sharing agreement in August, where some military people are still in government, but it is primarily civilian. Civilians are leading um, both the executive and constitutional and quasi legislative branches. They'll be having elections in a few months. Uh, but um, it really it was quite amazing to, to think about. Uh, especially since women and, and young people were very much in the lead here. The, the, the fact that women embraced the, the memory of the Kandaka, uh, who were this powerful matrilineal um, uh, series of powerful queens during the first millennium BC. Uh, it's from the, where, actually, it's where the name Candace comes from. <laughs> it's, uh, and they, uh, and they, they kept on having you know, their, their, their murals of the Kandaka all over the place and t shirts and just really reclaimed their power. That the misogynist regime, they were, you know, they, they challenging the myth that the, the kind of misogyny that the regime was trying to impose had anything to do with Sudanese history or culture. And so um, it was just, uh, you know, very impressive. Now, it's, 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 uh, you know, they're, they're, it's a struggle. They've, they've twice overthrown uh, governments uh, before nonviolently, 1964 and 1985, only to have the military come back, you know, within five or six years. Um, you know, they're, they're hoping that this movement, because it was more organic and, and, and had a strong grassroots base, it may hold on, but they have to improve the economy, which was totally wrecked by this incredibly corrupt and inept government. Unfortunately, Trump still has them on the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the state sponsors of terrorism list, even though you know, they threw out the people who were involved in that kind of thing. And uh, they even added Sudan to the no-fly list just recently. Uh, again, even despite, despite this, this democracy. So that, that's really hurting their economy. And like with the Iranian sanctions, it, it's, it makes it po very difficult for third parties in other countries, other companies, or international financial institutions to come in as well. If, you want, if, if uh, Sudanese American wants to send money to his family, they have to go through banks in, 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 in Qatar, and you know, it, it, transaction fees, it's real complicated. And, um, and, and so the Sudanese government's been giving in to various demands by the United States since the, uh, the uh, Bashir briefly harbored al-Qaeda in the 90s. Uh, they, uh, he, he successfully got in the Sudanese, uh, get impoverished country to, to pay a huge amount of money to the United States for the al-Qaeda attack on the SS Coal in Aden Harbor in, 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 in Yemen uh, back in the 1990s. And, and I mean things like this. So uh, they're 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 really really struggling, and it's such a hopeful sign. I mean, in a sense, though, that they were able to do this, and like so few people even heard about this thing. And you, you wonder why haven't more of us heard about this more re remarkable nonviolent revolution? And frankly, I think it's because a, a black, Arab, African, Middle Eastern people um, having agency, thinking strategically applying nonviolent action effectively simply doesn't fit into the Western narrative. And so I think it's, uh, I, I really uh, uh, hope that some of us here can help spread the word. In fact, you were kind of received as a, a hero because you've been paying attention and talking about Sudan. And <laughs> you, it, from what you put on Facebook, I, you seemed a little surprised. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it, was a, it was a bit awkward because I was there to learn from them. It was a research trip. Yeah. You know, because I, again, I, one of my research areas is, is um, uh, civil resist, nonviolent civil resistance against authoritarian regimes. And because it didn't, it, it fit all the categories of why it supposedly wouldn't work. <laughs> and they did it, and I wanted to find out more. So I was there to interview people and, and learn and, about and it. And rewrite but, the textbook. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, but uh, they had me give a couple of lectures at these universities. There are these huge crowds. They took me to this neighborhood committee where they had signs welcoming me because apparently some of my writings have been translated into Arabic, along with those of Gene Sharp and, and other other people who write on, uh, on nonviolent action. And uh, um, uh, there, was a, there was actually a mural with my name on it, along with Congresswoman Jayapal and... and uh, 
um, and and and, and uh, Tr Tr Richard Turner, the, the uh, African American journalist, and uh, uh, not Michael Nagler, who some of you know, and and, uh, yeah. and other other uh, NGO people. But um, yeah, it, it, it's it's um, it, to me it, it tells me and. I, I traveled to Central America during the war years down there in the mm -hmm. 80s. It is so important for people who are struggling uh, to get the attention of the American people, mm -hmm. not necessarily the yeah. government, mm -hmm. but the American yeah. people. Um, why do you think that is? I, I, I mean, it, given how much influence we have in the world, I think there, there's a strong, a lot of parochialism here. Um, I mean, just you really even basic things like uh, geography. Yeah, people people don't know. I mean, that's why Ray can get away with saying that Grenada was a transshipment point for Cuban arms to terrorists in Central America, because most Americans didn't know Grenada was in the opposite direction <laughs> of, <clears throat> from Cuba to Central America. Um, but uh, you know, it, 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 it's um. But but I I, I think it's it's really uh, I, I, what gives me hope is that the United States is becoming a more diverse nation, and here in California, we are particularly blessed by that that we get to hear narratives of people from. Uh, from other countries and other places and other perspectives, and the and younger people, we, thanks to the uh, uh, internet and, and and social media, have friends around the world and are hearing those stories. Yeah. I think one reason why, I, uh, with the exception of GLBTQ issues, um, there's hardly any issue that parallels age more than Israel Palestine. That young you know younger people are much more sympathetic to the Palestinian side than than, than, than people our age. And uh, I mean, when I first started teaching Middle East politics, uh, you know, 30, 35 years ago, I had to bend over backwards to, to make sure people had heard the Palestinian narrative because I assumed they came in with the, knowing the Israeli narrative. Yeah. Nowadays, I almost have to go the other direction, all the way around. That's I mean, really, it's quite, it's quite striking. Yeah. And, and, and part of it is, again, we're in a more diverse society, um, but also uh, that, that, you know, that people, um, people who get their news you know, more through online sources as opposed to the mainstream media you know, get to witness, see these eyewitness accounts of what's happening in, in places like the West Bank, uh, like in Sudan. Um, uh, and and uh, in fact, a lot of young people knew about Sudan because of, because of the blue for Sudan uh, meme that appeared on social media after the uh, martyrdom of a charismatic 23-year-old uh, 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 activist. Mm -hmm. um, and his supporters, you know, got that out. And, and so... Um, now that that uh, you know, we so we want about the you know people who spend too much time uh, on their phones or on the internet, but that sometimes does do a good job of getting the word out about these obscure struggles that you will not hear from the mainstream media. Yeah, there are some benefits. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, back to the audience. I think I see a hand here. If you'll stand up, please. What impact do you think that the population growth in the Middle East is having on the problems? Like I think Egypt is one of the highest birth rates in the world. Mm -hmm. The Palestinians have a very high birth rate. Mm -hmm. The uh, Israeli right wing has a very high <laughs> birth rate. I don't know about Sudan, but uh, many of those countries have very high birth rates mm -hmm. in a small area. So what impact will that have? Well, uh, as it has in other places of rapid uh, um, population growth and limited resources, uh, it take, puts real uh, strains uh, economically, um, even if a country is uh, you know, growing, you know, growing at a healthy 2 or 3 percent pace, if the population is growing that much, it's no net growth, um, not to mention the impact on the environment, and especially in areas you know, like, like Egypt, where 96 percent of the land is desert, everybody's crowded along the uh, uh, Nile, Val uh, you know, Nile Valley and the, uh, and the del uh, Delta, uh, makes it uh, more, more difficult, and the Palestinians are getting boxed in more and more as they're surrounded by Israeli settlements. And Israel, you know, won't let Palestinians expand uh, much. I mean, these demographic pressures are very real. Uh, but generally, as we found uh, in, in much of the world, initially in Europe and now in parts, in, in, now in Asia and parts of Latin America, where the birth rate dro the birth rate drops, is when people are secure, when people uh, have their basic needs met, when people aren't afraid that their children are going to die, either from uh, you know uh, malnutrition, disease, or, or violence. And so um, I think the, uh, you know, for uh, those, uh, uh, those of us concerned about uh, rapid population growth, I think our priority, uh, I mean, obviously family planning, empowering women, and all that kind of stuff is, is, real, is, uh, is good and important. Mm -hmm. But I think we also need to uh, 
of look at the uh, conditions which create the insecurity that drive people to have extra children, and to um, and then and, and, uh, and that's something that the United States can have an impact on in terms of supporting sustainable development, in terms of uh, of ending the Israeli occupation, in terms of uh, encouraging democratization instead of propping up dictatorships and the like. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, another one here in the audience. Here comes the microphone. Now, you talked about <clears throat> Israel and Palestine and uh, Iran. So my question is, what can we do to end U.S. support for Saudi Arabia? Well, that's an important one. I'm <laughs> really glad you raised that. Uh, the, um, um, Reserve the studio for another hour, tens please. Of thousands, <laughs> tens of thousands of people have died from U.S.-made uh, uh, ordnance dropped from U.S.-made planes uh, on that have been uh, support, uh, uh, sort of supported by U.S. Uh, troops in Saudi bases who have been training and engaging in maintenance and in targeting by the Saudi armed forces. You're talking uh, about Yemen, the war. Yeah, in Yemen. the bombing, the bombing in Yemen. Um, it is a huge crime, and and uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I mean, we were we were. Uh, we, we, are, we are justifiably horrified with the slaughter of, that Assad has inflicted upon uh, urban areas in, in Syria, and uh, and at least some people were upset at the, that that uh, um, uh, the crimes Israel has committed in crowded areas in Gaza and elsewhere. But uh, you know, the, 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 there's been relatively little attention done to the uh, genocidal war being uh, waged by the Saudis. Uh, it took. <laughs> The tens of thousands of Yemeni deaths didn't seem to have much impact, but the death of one Washington Post journalist was enough to shift uh, opinion in Congress uh, to finally uh, call for an end of arms transfers to, um, uh, uh, to Saudi Arabia. But then Trump declared a state of emergency uh, where he said our vital national security interests are at stake, so I'm going to continue sending arms there anyway and with his appointed judges upholding this uh, unilateral executive action, uh, we've done little to, to, to uh, the, the, the slaughter continues. I mean, I, I, um, I, I really wish we were doing some of the stuff we were doing back in the 80s in, in, in Central America, but with blockading uh, rail, rail lines and um, ports and other places where they're shipping this kind of uh, this, this lethal um, uh, equipment there because it is, it is an incredible tragedy. But, but the good news is I think this is one thing that a Democrat in the White House, even Biden, might shift because um, in the 2016 Democratic platform, there was a plank that uh, called for, um, um, that went on and on about all the terrible things about Iran. Um, but, uh, but every one of the things they listed were even more true with Saudi Arabia, and they didn't mention that. In fact, all he said, we should strengthen our security cooperation with Gulf states. So as recently as four years ago, the Democrats were supporting what's uh, the Saudis, and, and the bombing had been going on for at least a couple of years then. Yes. But again, thanks to the Khashoggi murder, that even people like Biden, who are big supporters of the uh, Saudi regime, are now realizing that politically it's impossible to justify that anymore. And, uh, and um, hopefully this will end uh, if a Democrat gets in the White House in, in January. Sanders, of course, has been kind of a leading voice. Yeah, he was and, the and leader. Adding, he was a leader on the Senate floor and, for, and, and doing this. So ironically, he got support from uh, Mike Lee, a conservative Republican from Utah, uh, <laughs> and they, they were the co-sponsors of the bill. Yeah, yeah. The, there's that old saying about yeah. politics and strange yeah, yeah. fellows. Uh, yeah. Of course, you know, Chris, what, what, by, uh, the big difference, of course, that, that I want to see if I can throw this in our last couple of minutes yeah. is that, uh, you know, uh, now, Sanders has been emphasizing that he was the floor leader in the, when he was in the House of Representatives against the um, authorization of the military force, use of military force to invade Iraq, whereas Biden was not only repeating, voting for the war and repeating Bush-Cheney um, talking points, he, as head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, only allowed for a day and a half of hearings. The most important foreign policy decision of a, li of, of a generation he only allowed a day and a half of hearings, and he blocked um, anti-war witnesses from uh, testifying. He stacked the, stacked the hearings with pro-war people. Uh, so he put, and remember, the Democrats controlled the Senate then. They, we yes. could, they could have stopped the war, prevented all this have. horror. But um, um, 
uh, but uh, he, um, but you know, Biden played the key role in getting it through. And there's a, actually a short 20-minute documentary, in which I'm briefly featured, um, by uh, Mark Weisbrot uh, put together, da narrated by um, um, Danny Glover. Uh, that that uh, that uh, uh, Danny, Danny Glover is, is a narrator. It talks about the, uh, the, the that looks very looks at this very issue about uh, um, uh, Biden and the war. So if you can you know, Google that uh, documentary, Biden Iraq War, Danny Glover, um, it should come up. <laughs> okay, uh, we we do have just a couple of minutes left. Um, you, you talked about uh, Trump just ignored the congressional action on Yemen. One thing that's uh, currently active, that the House and Senate have both passed um, war powers resolutions to try to keep uh, Trump from going, to, mm -hmm. from attacking Iran. The Senate version is slightly different, so it's headed back to the House. Um, what do you see playing out on, on that, um, on the war powers, and how important is that to, uh, to get that passed? I, I know you said earlier you think some of the the chance of a direct conflict is, is lessened a bit, but it's still very yeah, yeah, much Yeah, there. We're, we're a hair-trigger kind of situation. And again, I don't think, think uh, Trump necessarily wants a war, but uh, when you, when you go, engage that kind of brinkmanship, we came so close to war. Yes. Yeah. So close to war a few weeks ago. And of course, let's remember, this would not, we, we wouldn't be close to war if we hadn't invaded Iraq. Because the issue is American bases being supposedly threatened by um, Iranian-backed militia. Uh, prior to the invasion, there were no American bases and there were no Iranian back, back militia. These were a direct consequence of the invasion. Yeah. Um, but um, I'm but they, have to ask you to wrap it up. Yeah, uh, okay, seconds. okay. But, but, but briefly, I'm afraid uh, uh, Trump will, uh, will veto it. We may not have enough to, to override. But given that the War Powers Act of 1971 should have covered this already and it, and it hasn't, I don't think legislation enough is going to do it. What we need is people power to make sure that if you try something like that, we're going to shut this country down. All right. Yes. My guest has been Professor Stephen Zinnis, Professor of uh, Politics and International Studies at University of San Francisco. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I know you're busy. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. We'll be back April 7th with a special on the global climate strikes coming up in later April. Thanks. You've been watching Other Voices, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice. Mm -hmm.